In a world where God is dying, four heathens come to deliver the final nails in the coffin. From the depths of hell, Satan sends four puppets of the imperialist West and the Zionist Jews against God, Islam, and tiny kittens to bring you their propaganda and conspire for a new world order. This is Secular Jihadists from the Middle East. Good morning, good evening, everyone, wherever you are watching us from the globe. Uh, my name is Faisal Saeed al Mutar. I'm the host of the Secular Jihadist podcast, and the one and only uh, Yasmin is with us. Hello, Yasmin. Hello, Faisal. And uh, she did a, gave a great talk. I just listened to it recently, and she's the author of the Confessions of an Ex-Muslim and you can go to our website, confessionofnextmuslim.com. Uh, with us, we have Ali Rizvi, uh, the author of The Atheist Muslim. And he's going to have an event in Toronto uh, around September 11th, right? Like something around that. Yeah, we've got a lot of stuff coming up September and October. There's, uh, the, we'll, we'll announce them all. So so check so. out, uh, uh, if you guys are interested in Ali Rizvi's talks, check out his Facebook page and follow his recent talks. Uh, we have Armin Navabi, who just came from London, from the secular yes. conference with uh, Maria Namazi. Uh, uh, did you give a talk, Armin, there? or? Yes, I did. Yes, yes you did. Was. So uh, please, guys, check out Armin's latest talk at the secularconference.com. Very well received, too. He actually talked about the topic that we're going to be discussing later on today. Yes. Um, Great. So uh, go to the Atheist Republic. So Armin is the, also happens to be the founder and the ad the main admin of the Atheist, Atheist Republic. Uh, check out that as well. And I'm going to, and we'll, we'll have a guest who is a person of color. I'm going to let Armin, not uh, Yasmin, introduce our guest, Bilal, Habibi Bilal. Go ahead, I Yasmin. <laughs> Actually, we're going to just let Bilal introduce himself. Bilal, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, my name is Bilal. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Um, uh, I'm another brown guy. That's how Faisal described me. Yeah, <laughs> another brown guy. That's how Faisal put me up. So uh, I'm an activist. Back, I'm a Libyan activist. I, I'm from Benghazi, Libya. You may ha have heard of the city from the recent, not recent, 9-11, 2012 attack on the U U.S. embassy, which killed the U.S. ambassador. And which what, what is Benghazi? The, is it in, uh, is Benghazi in, in Afghanistan? Is it in Afghanistan? Libya. No, in wasn't Libya. it in 2011? Under, <laughs> was it 2011 or 2012? <laughs> September 11. Okay. Okay. So yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's a, on September 11, Libya time. I don't know America mm. time. So yeah, and uh, yeah, I'm from there. I'm, I used to be a lawyer back home, and uh, and I moved to Canada, of course, because of the war and because of like the constant threats for. People who I wasn't even uh, out, quote unquote, yet, or even thinking about coming. But, you mean out uh, as a as a atheist? But like I was, atheist, uh, yeah. yeah. But I was like, uh, I was uh, how there. So this is how it started. I was very close with the with activists organizing protests against terrorism, against uh, extremism in Libya. Just terrorism, not just even religion or anything. And <laughs> that led me to finding out that like there is a direct connection when you try to say to somebody, you try to say anything like, terrorism is not us, terrorism is not our religion, and somebody would say, no, 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 it, it is. And I have like proof, and I can show you, you can read it in Arabic. And especially I've been, I studied Sharia for most of my life and I'm a lawyer, so I can read Arabic really well. So I started reading this stuff and I was like, yeah, uh, they're right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm not going to be religious anymore, but I'm just going to leave that stuff here. But when I, mm -hmm. when I moved out of Libya, that's when like, I had to, you were so pushed I, that's out of when Libya, I, right? I could start thinking safety. about considering it. Yeah. Considering it. And I can talk about it this is the first time i maybe ever talking about it publicly but yeah this is yeah nice so, so 
So the um, uh, so the, I, mean, I, I guess what you're saying is that whenever you try to just speak about terrorism, you're like, okay, I'm not going to bring religion into it. I'm just going to talk about terrorism. You speak yeah. against terrorism, and then people come in. They're like, but terrorism is in our religion. It's right here. Look at the scripture. And then, and then suddenly you're you're like, okay, how do I? I can't talk about one without talking about the other. Actually, I was an apologist for uh, for a long time. I was an apologist. I was one of those people who said, no, 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 there is no connection. No, no, no. It's all misinterpretation. It's all historical violence it's all you're all ignoring the the good stuff and the violent stuff maybe it's necessary because it's it's a realistic wrong. religion that's what wrong. i used to call it yeah. <laughs> wrong yeah, yeah. yeah that's what i used to call it, a realistic religion it has violence because right, real life has violence you know that's why why change your mind then when you st when you start seeing the real consequences when you see when you see the religion and start to be enforced and when you see how terrorism is directly, and not just terrorism, that's a small, small sector of those who are affected by it. women, children, uh, gays, uh, genital mutilation. It's, it's a whole uh, spectrum of people getting affected by it, not just terrorism, not just direct violence. It's a, it's a whole... But then, uh, but then as a Muslim, I would say, but that's not God's doing, that's m human fe beings human yeah doing and that's say, where say, and that's where when you become an activist and you try to convince people otherwise of terrorism they religious people especially they were like no 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 it is it, it is like come here come here we can show you this is the verse it's like it's like what, what ali rizvi does like uh, but in reverse like no no it is it's just true it's terrorism what come on what do you hate it come on it's true it's just like <laughs> you have to accept it then and it's like, oh, you make the connection. And then you, you listen to them. And you listen to the valiant people. You listen to the people who abuse their children and their women in the name of religion and all of that. And then you mm -hmm. can see the direct wait, wait. connection. Did you mean to say Reza Aslan instead of Ali, Ali Rizvi? I, I was saying Ali Rizvi. Ali Rizvi points out to extremist verses in religion. And he points out to the direct connection to terrorism or violence or whatever. But yeah. the religious people doing it in a reverse way, they were showing me the direct connection in religion with violence and, and terrorism. Because I was mm -hmm. trying to convince them it's not. But they were like, no, it is. Yeah. Here, see it. And and that's something yeah. Ali Rizvi do. That's too. He, he tries to out religion by, yeah, this is it, it is violent. And here it is. Like, you can see it. Mm -hmm. Okay, this so devil's advocate. So devil's advocate. What if what if somebody comes and says, okay, so if you as an atheist or an ex-Muslim is are trying to argue that these verses are violent, then you are agreeing with these terrorists and you're making the case for them. Why are you agreeing with terrorists? How would you respond to that? I would say, talking honestly about violence and about ignorance in the religion and the direct connection into real life is gonna is gonna uncover that that behavior and that action if you want to if you want to be honest that's how it's going to be you're mm -hmm. not going to defeat terrorism by being d dishonest they're going to be honest and they're going to tell you no it, th here it is it's an our religion and you're going to be the liar you're going to be you're going to be losing the battle mm -hmm. of of battle of ideas by lying honestly lying that's it. i mean i'm sure i'm not sure i agree with this view but but i mean I mean, it sure depends. Okay. Like, if let you me, want to defeat me, terrorism, let me put it in a life. better way. Okay, how do how, uh, yes. what's the better what's the best way to fight bad ideas? Bullets using violence or using logic and truth and realistic approach? That's how well, you defeat neither. extremism and bad ideas. I would say neither. I would say neither. But but go ahead. I, I I wouldn't use violence. I wouldn't use bullets. I would use the the truth. I would use the the, the direct connection. I would use my my intelligence honesty. to show them how yeah honesty yeah exactly you have to be honest even if you have to agree with not them not to be on, the devil's advocate here not to be the devil's advocate here but like okay uh when you're trying to as someone who kind of have some experience in fighting terrorism as we call it and that's uh i mean obviously there are people who are much more experts and, and much more dedicated than i am in, do, in doing this fight but like if you look at the most successful examples of defeating terrorism if you look at like mm -hmm. defeating al-qaeda in iraq mm -hmm. what what really defeated many parts of al-qaeda in iraq was not 
uh, people from Fallujah being convinced that the theory of evolution was true. <laughs> it was uh, the people from the U.S. Army, ma mainly led by David Petraeus and many generals of the U.S. Army who worked with the tribal forces. Many were Sunni okay. people. Uh, and then we built coalitions. And then when we tried to build coalitions, and then you were able to defeat Al-Qaeda house by house. So, like, if you're going to talk about defeating terrorism, I mean, there's, there's a difference between defeating an extremist ideology and defeating terrorism. I mean, if you're going to talk about defeating terrorism as a, if you want to defeat extremist ideology on the long run, which, which good luck to you in the next million years, you'll be able to do that. But uh, if you're going to be able to defeat terrorism as a, as an organized militias, if you're going to talk about Al Mahdi Army, and Asaab Al Haq, and Tadim Al Qaeda, and Dawud Al Islamiyya, if you're going to talk about them as militants. Faisal, you're getting then, into then, too many details now. Can we just take okay. it back Can a I step? answer? Can I answer? Can I answer, uh, Faisal? Okay. Can I answer Faisal's yeah. questions? Just a second. Faisal, is, is terrorism defeated in Iraq? You're talking about terrorism as if it was defeated. You're talking about as if Iraq, a US Army came and defeated terrorism, and there is no terrorism anymore. No, but there, but there are ways in which Al Qaeda was defeated. Was I mean, obviously, we're not going to get to the nitty gritty of how Iraq is still unsafe. There is still war there. It, the battle of ideas is not still won. There is still the same ideology still running rapid there. What, it's I, was, not what I was trying to say is that, like, it's not I a mean, there, there are better. I mean, what I'm saying is like there are multiple ways of defeating terrorism than the battle of ideas. Okay, because battle show of ideas. Me, show me a successful battle. What other what other ways? Yeah. Tell us. Show me. Yes, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, if you want to defeat extremists, there's a difference between defeating terrorism as a militant groups and the difference between terrorism as an ideology. So, okay. if you are talking about defeating terrorist groups, so for example, the liberation of Mosul that is mostly made by the Iraqi army and many factions within uh, militias like. A lot, uh, like a, a PMF, which is called Problem Popular Mobilization Force, uh, that was a success of defeating terrorism. And it was done by force. I mean, obviously, it was done by working. I mean, obviously, this one was a much harder failure than the previous one in 2007, in which the 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 ground was different. But this was an act of defeating terrorism. But I think what you're trying to say, I'm trying to. I'm trying to encourage you. I'm not trying to discourage you from what you're saying. But what you're trying to say is that fighting good ideas would be uh, getting us fighting extremist ideology that leads to terrorism. Is that is that a correct way of assessing what you're saying? Because defeating terrorism have multiple thousand mul ways of doing that. Here's the thing. Defeating a group, an de individual group, there is a, a way to de defeat an individual group. <clears throat> what I'm talking about is the big picture in, in history and in how to defeat bad, ide bad ideas in, in societies, in, 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 in religion, and in, in how in 1400s, how they came out of the Dark Ages, how, how the Renaissance came about, how, how the French Revolution came about. It's a battle of ideas. It wasn't a battle of, uh, a battle of like bullets. It was more of a, a French Revolution, maybe a, too too violent <laughs> but yeah yeah so um i think when we if we take it back bilal was saying that there are some people that say basically islam is a religion of peace and it's not encouraging any kind of terrorism and through his study of sharia because he's a lawyer he discovered that actually even though he was one of the apologists that was saying terrorism has nothing to do with Islam, he discovered that actually Islam was encouraging terrorism. So Faisal, do you agree or disagree with that statement? Do you, the, the Quran and the Hadith, do you think that they are discouraging any kind of terrorism or do you think that they are encouraging it? Yeah, I mean, I mean that, that brings us, that's going to be the next discussion of our episode of, of Islam versus Islamism, right? No, just it's, just in a nutshell, yes or no? Do you think that Islam in general encourages people to cut off each other's heads, cut off hands, cut off clitorises, or do you think that it's does not that it's actually peaceful? For yeah, I mean, t t terms and conditions apply would be my answer. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna say no. I'm not gonna say yes. But but I would say that. There is definitely a connection between 
behavior and religious belief, or at least interpretation of religious belief. So yes, I mean, if if someone thinks of Islam as in a literalist way, uh, then there is a direct connection between that and terrorism. So you mean if they take the if they yeah. take the word of Allah and they actually yeah yeah there's a plausible there's a plausible interpretation uh, and that leads to that. Uh, but but I think it's like what what is the issue is that when you say Islam, I mean what is Islam? You ask ten Muslims what Islam is, and they give you a different answer. So the but I mean, but I would say with the, a, with Islam a literal, has, as codified in the Quran and uh, the the canonical scriptures. But the Quran doesn't speak for itself, right? So the Quran needs people who interpret the, the, the way they want Islam, to. The, the Quran is the only thing. Reza, Reza, is that you? <laughs> No, come on. Let's be fair. Let's be fair to Faisal. The the Quran is it's no. He faced... It's all of the, the all Muslim sects, regardless of denomination or uh, differences. They all agree on just one thing. You know, apart from Muhammad, even Muhammad, not everybody agrees on. Some people think on, the other figures seven, are more On but seven it, things, they all agree on seven things. Well, the Quran is one the the central thing. That everybody agrees on, but but they don't agree that like Ali uh, that Imam Ali was the was the one mentioned in the Hadith Kitab al Bafihi or Dark Kitab al Bafihi. So so things <laughs> like <laughs> if you if you, if you look at if you look at what Muslims so, so, so there there's some things that are open to interpretation. But if you go to Surah five verse thirty eight where it says that you cut the hands off of thieves, I mean that that is that is clear. If you if you look at the uh, the the things that strike them upon the neck and the fingertips. The, that the is fact, clear. Okay, okay, but the fact that it's vague makes it more dangerous. If I make a book, the authority it's, for everything, guys. and in, and wait, let me just say this. Let me just finish with this. And it could mean anything. And it could mean anything to anybody. That means I could use this book for good, and I could use this book for evil. But the fact is that people are doing good with that books, anyways. So a book that could you, that you elevate to such high authority that could be used for such evil should be struck down. Do you understand? Like the vagueness of it makes it easier to use as a tool, as a as a weapon of manipulation. Guys, can I say this something? This is true, Armin, but I, I want something? Ali to finish his point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, Bilal, go ahead. So I was saying, everybody keeps saying it's vague. Have you read it in Arabic, in the mother language? Have you? It's not vague. Mm -hmm. It's not vague. It's not vague. I know. The hadith is not vague. The hadith is more clear than ever than ever you, you could ever think. It has vague parts and it has non-vague parts. No, no, no. In Arabic, mm -hmm. it has the non -vague, the vague parts you're talking about is linguistics, old Arabic linguistics. That's been taken from Hebrew. That's been. Here's the thing. Arabic now has 28 letters. When it was when it when the Quran was written, it had almost 14. 16 was or added later on, and because they added dots to some letters, and and we know that now, and we know the le the original language they, they they were taken from. Do you know that it's the first Arabic written language book ever? The Quran. There is no yeah. other older reference so we can take from. Mm -hmm. The vague you're it talking about is the first Arabic is, written book. Okay. Yeah, the vagueness you're talking about is some is things we can actually point on and we can tell the original language. It's not vague. We can tell the violent parts, and it's very obvious in Arabic. The vagueness comes in the trans I in translation. Stuff like Alif Lam meme, stuff like there's some things that are completely like cryptic. But right, that's stuff Quran where you can say vagueness. It doesn't go over an Arab who's, who read it in Arabic. It doesn't go over yes. my head. Vagueness. I'm not discussing that. You are absolutely correct, Bilal. People that don't speak Arabic, Bilal, they don't get that. And they yeah. sometimes, apologists like to say, oh, it's it's open to interpretation. And then people that don't speak Arabic are like, oh, yeah, so it's totally open to interpretation. And it's very confusing. If you look at Shakespearean English, for example, and you look at the English we speak today, it's it's different. There's a big difference. But if you're if People don't realize that classical Arabic, fusha, is still used today. When it tells you to hit your wife, it, that word, darb, is still used today. There's nothing, nobody's going to, nobody can say it's grapes or go towards her or all the bullshit that they're coming up with. This is a, this is a very common word that's still in Arabic vernacular. So thank you, Bilal, for saying that. 
because I think that that's something that's very confusing for people. They tend to think that er, that the Quran is so open to interpretation. It's, it's not, actually not that open to interpretation. No. It's pretty clear. I I mean, I, I mean, I agree with that in principle. I mean, the, the thing is like, people, I mean, I mean, there is the Quran and there are people, right? The, the, so the Quran itself is not a human being. It's not a conscious human being that says that this is what I really, really meant. And that's why you have all these sects within Islam and you have 1 billion Muslims who do not agree what the Quran says because the Quran cannot speak for itself and says, this is literally what I mean. So in a, in a way, the Quran is open to interpretation because it is dependent on the people who are reading it. I can't believe you just said that to me, Faisal. So, okay, the Quran, the Quran is actually... Still love okay, you, the, yes, I love you, yes. The Quran is actually this. pretty... When If you read the Quran in any language, in any language, it's pretty clear that it's anti-non-believer, that it is violent, that it is, you know, it's act, asking for... It's anti-woman, right? It's pre, Those things are pretty clear. Like, you have to be really... Um, I don't know, I don't want to say anything insulting. But um, it, those are pretty clear. When I say something... There are some parts that are unclear there, you know, when you read a story and the story is pretty clear, it, you don't, you know what the story is about. You're just like, what am I supposed to do with the story? You don't understand, like, you know, it's a story that doesn't, you can't, it's not very clear the purpose of God telling Muhammad the story. You know what I mean? Some, there are some weird shits happen sometimes that there is no vagueness i'm not saying it's vague as if it could mean this or could mean that no it's pretty clear the story exactly what happened in the story it's just that it just sometimes you don't know why the story was said the context what, what, of the story the background okay. and circumstances can I, can I comment yeah. on something? Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah faisal you're shia you don't know how the quran works in arabic oh no you didn't yeah, yeah no yeah. you didn't there's two schools <laughs> in, in islam and we know that there's two that means to take you back in history. <laughs> Shia yeah. are the people who started questioning the, the Quran and go, uh, go back to Hadith. They're actually the innovator of going back to, to Hadith. There is two schools in early Islam. It's called the school of Al-Hadith and school, a school of Al-Ra'i. The school of opinion, then the school of uh, and Hadith. The school of Hadith says um, we have to go to the actions and uh, of the Prophet. The school of opinion says... The Quran doesn't, it's, not, it's vague. We don't understand what it says, even in Arabic, because they weren't speak. a lot of them weren't speaking Arabic. A lot of them were Persian, Armin. That's why they didn't uh, understand the uh, uh, Quran. And that's why when they talk hey, yeah. Quran, they were there's like, there's 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 going on now. <laughs> Here's the Without thing. Without Salman thing. Farsi, Muhammad wouldn't even be around for when a religion. When Persians took Quran, they actually brought some. They tried to brought, to bring be, peace to it by saying it's vague. We don't understand it. It's vague. Mm. That's why we're not gonna be as violent as Sunni people. That's why our, That's why. That's why Faisal. Sorry. Automatically, Faisal says it's it's unclear to us. That's because in 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 Iraq in. When as Islam was introduced to them, that's how it's introduced. It's vague. You may interpret it in a different way. I never said the inter I never said it's vague in that sense. You guys, guys, do, do you see what's going on here? What's going on here is that not only is there sectarianism based on interpretation <laughs> of the Quran, but there's sectarianism here happening based on the interpretation of the interpretation of the Quran. So there you go. This is no. we've got meta. Okay, no, actually, I'm pretty sure I, most of us agree here that the Quran is pretty clear on some of the messages that it's trying to get out there. Okay, all of them. When I, when, I, yeah, I think I, I think with Fessel, uh, one thing I, that... I studied it. I studied Quran, all of them. I can yeah, be but clear we are agreeing. We are agreeing them. with That's we it. are agreeing with you. Okay, it's we're not agreeing with you. It's, we agree it's, with you. It's, it's, it's like saying when, the U.S. Okay. okay, let's let's step away from this whole story. I, I'm sorry yeah, if I'm, yeah, I'm but... getting confrontational, but I have another bone to pick pick with you guys. From uh, I'm gonna change the subject. Okay, uh, great. From uh, great. the last seminar we met. We were talking with, uh, I was talking to Armin and I was asking the question to you on Armin and I was talking about Donald Trump and if people come asking me who should they vote for in the election because I'm from Benghazi. That's what I want to know mm -hmm. about. I want to hear all about Benghazi. Yes. Yes, yeah, so tell okay. us actually, actually, I mean, I have a close of friends. I'm not, I'm not going to mention her name, but uh, she is a doctor from Benghazi who lives now in the United States. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you probably know her because she's from the, she's from the, I know her. Okay. I good. know her. Uh, so I am, I've heard many of her stories about Benghazi. Uh, tell us, tell us yours. Tell, I mean, were you there when the attack happened, when the Al Qaeda attack, uh, on embassy? Okay, I wasn't there. Come on, you want to get no, no. in trouble? I mean, what are you in Benghazi? What are you at the time? What are you in the city when the attack happened? Yes, I was very close to the building actually in that time. So, so tell I us, tell us like how, tell us about the Bengali story. What, what is, what is about Americans and the ways they don't understand a Benghazi story coming from a guy who lived from yes. Benghazi? Okay, yeah, sure. There will be a lot of, there will be a few Trump supporters who will be like, well, Bengali or Bengazi? Bengali? Like they're not going to know. So actually, we need some clarification. One of my most famous tweets actually is like, give us Benghazi back. They took Benghazi from us. If you go <laughs> on Twitter, Benghazi, Benghazi is no longer Benghazi. It's mm -hmm. their Benghazi. It's whatever they talk about in America. It's not a city anymore. It's a, it's a topic. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so, okay, let's go back to the revolution. Let's go back to Gaddafi just for a little bit. Gaddafi oh, yeah, was yeah, a yeah. tyrant. Yeah, Gaddafi was a tyrant. He was a he was an Islamist, actually, and a militarist. Tyrant. That's actually something that people don't know about him. Uh, tell, was, tell us more about his Islamist let stuff. Him, let him finish his story. Okay. Okay. No. Uh, when he started, he don't was, tell me uh, what to do, Armin. Don't tell me what to do. Go back to your country. <laughs> Go ahead. When he okay, started, Bilal, when speak. Gaddafi, you, I, I was uh, first of all, I was gonna start for, from 2012. You took me back to 2011. Now I'm gonna go to the, the 69. Oh boy. Okay, Gaddafi. Yeah, because because many people. The reason I'm asking is like because many people think Saddam was a secular. He wasn't. I, he wasn't. And I always say Saddam in his last year was an Islamist. And people were like, what? He was a secular dictator. I'm like, no, you're just stupid. You don't understand what's <laughs> had, going on. He had so so many can you, religious can you tell us more? Can you tell us more about Gaddafi Islamist leanings? Because many people, many stupid people in America and elsewhere think yeah. that Gaddafi was a secular dictator. So like, t tell us more about his Islamist stuff. Let me first agree with you that Saddam wasn't a secular, he was an Islamist, just like Gaddafi. Gaddafi was praying five times a day, That's that was famous about him. He would cut any meeting just to go praying. That's famous about him. His first declaration, when he after the revolution, he was saying, oh, we're going to use Islam, the beautiful Sharia, to restore our beautiful values, our beautiful Islam. And in 1977, he issued the... Uh, Liberation Act of like uh, direct uh, direct uh, democracy, he called it. It pushed back on religion. It pushed back on the, uh, and he was he was secular by 1977. He was a little bit of secular, but in 1986, that's when uh, Iraq uh, when uh, that's when uh, Americans invaded uh, not Americans uh, Russia invaded uh, uh, Afghanistan. And that's when he found out he can he can send his violent criminals, his violent op 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 opposition. He can send. He found a way to send them to fight in jihad for in in Afghanistan. And he was Gaddafi. One one was one of the first recruiters of going to Afghanistan. And he was funding programs in a city called Derna, not far from Benghazi. And and Benghazi, and he was funding programs in Benghazi uh, Salafists who were preaching to go to uh, to uh, Afghanistan, and they were saying like, "Oh, this Bin Laden guy, uh, he's fighting for Muslims in the, in in Afghanistan. The Muslims in Afghanistan are getting slaughtered." Uh, Gaddafi was all about that. In nineteen, it didn't take long for him to realize. In nineteen ninety four, they came back from Afghanistan, and they started a religious coup against him, an Islamist coup against him. And they were, there was so many terrorist attacks in Libya back then. In 1996, Gaddafi solved the problem the only way he could solve it. He had a secret prison that had thousands of uh, uh, political prisoners, uh, especially from terrorist groups, and he killed 1,200 people in, in an hour. He gunned them down in an hour because they protested. The, the same families of the people who he killed, they started uh, protesting openly because he actually didn't tell them they were sorry i'm gonna skip i skipped a little bit he didn't tell them that he killed their kids and they st they kept visiting and they kept telling them you're not gonna see your kids but they're alive and well he took five years until he started telling them one by one 
your son died. Your son died. Your kid died now. Your son died a few days ago. He had cancer. And when he announced it, it was pretty, uh, by 2003, uh, the story was out because there were people hiding in the kitchen in the prison and they reported the story and some prison guards had, had got run out of the country. And it, it, by 2003, there was like, a, it was an open secret. Everybody knew that he killed 1200 people in an hour. So the families of those people, they started protesting. They started protesting openly. That was very new in Libya. Against uh, the, they were in, they just did it. They didn't even just want uh, justice. They just want the the bodies. And they just want to bury their kids. That's all they protested for. In 2006, there was the infamous uh, cartoons made about Mohammed. Have you seen them? Uh, the in Denmark. Denmark, right? In yeah, Denmark. Yes. In Denmark, there was a big, big protest in Benghazi. Uh, uh, in front of the Italian embassy, and they kicked down the uh, the flag, and they and they burned down the embassy. But something actually happened. The city started revolting against Gaddafi, and Gaddafi had to surround the city with an army. And he actually had to call the elders like of the city and tell them, "I'm gonna bomb it. That's it." But there, in three days, the revolution was was dead, and that happened in February 17, 2006. Let's jump to 2011. The families of the victims they were protesting again, but the the the, the they now file a lawsuit against uh, the the government. The government, Gaddafi's government, has uh, jailed the uh, lawyer. And at the same time, the uh, the memorial of this February 17th almost revolution came about in the same time. And Arab Spring was happening in Tunisia and uh, Egypt. So it was the perfect storm for a revolution in Libya. That's when, uh, that's in February, two, uh, February 17, 2011. Am I talking too much, guys? Sorry. Am I boring you? No, no, no. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Okay. You're, you're the guest. Okay, but you're building you. up to uh, 2012, okay. right? 20, 2011. Uh, the uh, the revolution happened. When we started the revolution, it was honestly some decent people, some moderate people who wanted to change, who wanted democracy. But in the beginning, we actually started noticing Islamists coming back from other countries and taking over. From the beginning, we started noticing that. And we started telling people, uh, not people, like the Americans who are starting to watch the revolution, hey, watch out for these people. And just listen to the people on the ground and the Libyans, you know. That's where uh, the, the NATO decided to get involved. And when they started bombing Gaddafi and the campaign happened. And during the revolution, Islamists were taking over the country while the revolution and the war, civil war against Gaddafi happened. Because there was a portion of the country that's what, that was pro-Gaddafi. And... Uh, and that was, that's when uh, Islamists took over the, the, the revolution. It was becoming an Islamist revolution. By the end of it, when they killed Gaddafi and they st uh, tortured him, and they actually stuck up, uh, you know, what happened a to him. A knife off his ass, yeah, I know. It's yeah. Sodomized. It's yeah, and it was ugly. And actually, I was actually happy about it back then, and I, and I had to regret it later. And I had to, because I was traumatized and with the war. Anyway, I was treating for that. Uh, but but Islamists wanted to continue that with his people and with his with his uh, followers, and that's when we started telling the Americans, "Hey guys, can you back off the Islamists who were coming? Because most of the Islamists in Libya, Li Libyan Islamists, they were living in Canada, they were living in the America, they were living in Europe, they were living in, U in the UK." And when they came, they came with their influence and they came with, with their connections. The American ambassador, the American, the U, uh, the British ambassador, all they're connected to are Libya, uh, Libyan Islamists. They're not connected to Libyan seculars. And they consider Libyan seculars to be unpopular, to be uh, uh, some sort of a, uh, aggressive groups or something like uh, to be and uh, Islamophobic, actually. They, they called us Islamophobic. <laughs> and that's where starting uh, tr trusting Islamists. Uh, it seems, it seems like you are Islamophobic. 
Because like you're a slum of Yeah, <laughs> I'm a little bit. <laughs> no, okay. that, that is the biggest problem right there. You just put your finger on it. That's the that's the biggest problem. Us included, right? Yeah, and that's where we started t- actually talking to Hillary Clinton because she was the, sta- is, is the head of the State Department and, and she was visiting Libya because they had a lot of interest in Libya and she was visiting and their ambassadors yeah. were getting closer to Islamists and we were telling them, hey guys, yeah. back off the yeah. Islamists, back off the Islamists. In Egypt, we were telling them back off too. The day before he died, so just let me just let well, me just you say, say that no, no, wait, hold on. Get, just getting to this, the good part. This note will you will you will be interested. The day by before we, who died, do you mean we? Who do you mean we? That what which group do you mean by we? Secular's activists, uh, activists, activists. Let's say activists. Okay, not activists a group. Not were, like some a... of them were religious Libyans who are just against terrorism. Just even mm. some religious people. Anyway, when we the day before he died. He was meeting with an Islamist leader who was telling him, Wissam bin Ahmed, who is actually now you can find his picture with Al-Qaeda and with a, a ISIS flag. And he was meeting him and Wissam bin Ahmed was comfortable enough to tell him, please no, don't talk to anybody anymore. Islamists have the legitimacy. It's open now. You can just go on and see it. And the second day when he went, uh, the, it was a protest against the movie. It was actually a, a planned terrorist attack. I don't, I don't have enough evidence to say that because it's still in court, but I can say that it, it's planned enough that Islamist group that called, jihadists called each other to say, let's attack the embassy today. But the day before, he was with an Islamist leader who, who was killing people. The second day, they, they got, he got killed. The, the ambassador himself, Chris Stevens, rest in peace. He was just the most wonderful person you could ever meet. Uh, I met him twice, but he was a sweet person who actually wanted the best for Libya. But that was a policy he had to follow. And that was maddening for me that when I, when that's where it jumped to the, uh, the lecture where I met you guys and I was telling you, Somebody came to me and said, who should I vote for, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump? And honestly, I was like, I, I hate Donald Trump for uh, for his uh, opinions on climate change and uh, and anybody, anything you hate. He's a liar and whatever. He's a douchebag. And, but like, I cannot say vote for Hillary Clinton. I was stunned. I cannot say. Yeah, I mean, what you just said really confirms many of my Libyan friends, and not only Libyan friends, but Egyptian friends too, after the Arab Spring and they were talking about Hillary Clinton and let me tell you something all my secular friends from both Egypt and Libya all had an extremely negative views about Hillary like I mean this is not for me this is not new maybe it's new public to all of who was a, a big fan of Hillary <laughs> but other than that like if Hold you on, ask it's not new to me at all yeah, like I you understand that's most, personally that's if you ask thing. most secularists personally but my friends did Every activist who tried to do something, we tried to meet her personally. We met her team. We met the people around her. We met the State Department. We were trying our very best because it was our country, you know? Can, can That's you tell us, more, really can you tell us more about this? And, because... By the way, I'm not, I'm not a huge, huge fan of her. I just, I supported her for the this election. I mean, I yeah, can't I understand. Really vote yeah. for her, but I supported her over all of the other choices uh, that were there. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Bilal, this is getting really interesting. Yes. Can you tell us more because... I think I ran to a lot of these issues, because, uh, and it's good to for you to explain. Like, tell us, can you tell us more about these meetings with the State Department and many folks? Because many people, like, if you like, when many of us criticize the Obama administration, and rightly so, for pretty much betraying. And may I also recently wrote this article in the Havoc Post. That people should read about the left betrayal, the liberal betrayal of the uh, of the West of the Eastern liberals, and you are one of these people. So. Can you tell us more about these meetings and the betrayal you have felt by Democrats, by Hillary Clinton herself, and many of her folks? I mean, you are a liberal. I mean, you are a secularist from Libya. Most likely, you share most of our values and most of the values you uh, uh, Westerners believe in. So I don't. Sh- I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm. I'm. I'm not sure. I don't know what you got. I'm. I'm. I'm mixed. But. But. He's. He's but, sushi. Can you like can you ex sushi? Can you yeah. tell us more about the betrayal? Yeah, sushi is Sunni and Shia, but the combination. Yeah. Can, tell us more about the betrayal. Like, tell us what okay. you, what you have felt when you are in okay. these meetings. and people say, "I'm not going to support you. I'm going to support the Islamists." Over yeah. Here. I never been to a meeting myself. I, I hate these meetings. 
I, I don't like to go to them. I, I like protesting. I like organizing these things, but I don't like going to the meeting. But how did you feel anyway about that happening? Yeah, here's the thing. I like meeting with the UN. I like the United Nations. I like because they're official. Uh, their their presence in Libya is much more official than the Americans. You don't know who you're speaking with the Americans. They have teams. They, that's the weirdest thing. They, they would have teams running in hotels. Oh, we're with the uh, defense. We're with the uh, state Are you department. talking about with the, the Americans right now? I don't want to deal with you. The Americans, you, they're shading. You're, you don't know what you're dealing with. I like dealing with the ambassador because you can tell that's the ambassador. That's the official position. But my friends who went to the meetings, who went to uh, to see what the what the Americans had to say, all the American message was, how can you include uh, the Islamists? How can you include uh, those who, who felt uh, under uh, stress under Gaddafi? Gaddafi killed a lot of Islamists. Islamists now want to feel safe in Libya. How are you saying, how are you being unwelcoming to them? And that was the main message. We want to actually open Libya to Islamists. And we want to, one of them, I was like, go to them and tell them, okay, I want to open Americans to KKK. Mm -hmm, And I want to include KKK mm -hmm. in the American leadership. Because I want to, I feel like KKK in America is not well represented. (laughs) And they feel like their opinions are are undervalued. That's why. But, but why though? Why, why do you think the U.S. Um, or whether it's Democrats, probably, okay, or whatever okay, it is. okay. I, I try to look for, for things from both sides. I try to look from the from the uh, well-meaning side. To, they think actually Islamists are peaceful and misunderstood. Brown people. They think. Um, uh, brown. Uh, they think. Uh, is, is it because they're the majority? Yeah, but they think like Islamists are the, the the Muhammad who they know in Starbucks who are cool who, who might drink now and then. They, they, they're the most organized yeah. ones. At yeah. the time. I think that's what it is. I think that's what yeah, it is. They, I think they, it's they because think, they're more. They think they, they think Muslims are like Rosa Aslan, uh, nice, uh, nice, a uh, nice like uh, yeah, like maybe like even Linda Sarsour. Who's that? Who's a spicy Islam Muslim, you know? But she's not a violent Muslim. But when they bring back Islamists to Libya, then I they think are. it's not ideological. It's it's more practical than ideological, don't you think? Like, don't you think because the Islamist has the most funding, the most organized, the most the one with the most power? That too. So they, that, too yeah. that too. I think the Islamists had a jump start on on most Libyans because they were refugees in the states from the eighties and the nineties. And the and the in the UK, especially in the UK, they have a lot of refugees there. They ran from Gaddafi, and they were in in the US and the UK since the nineties and eighties by by thousands. My family members, a lot of my family were there in in Switzerland. That's where, if you actually look at the war, the second civil war in Libya right now, a lot of the people who died in in the battlefield are Libyan are Libyan civil citizens who came back from Switzerland and the United States who just decided to fight in Libya. Libyan Islamists, that's why they're well connected. That's why you see like Islamists well connected in the America, in America well better than in Canada. Islamists in Canada, Muslim Brotherhood in Canada are way more organized than Libyan seculars in Canada because they're here since the 90s and 80s. They had they had mosques. They had they had they've been oppressing people like Yasmin since the 1980s. They've been they've been organized. I, I bet Yasmin knows a lot of Libyans who came back to Libya and have joined the extremist groups in, in fighting in Libya right now. Yeah, I mean, I mean the same, the same. What you just described is kind of similar to what happened to Iraq in a way, because in the 1980s, uh, many people who were Shia extremists left Iraq yeah, and became Shia. refugees. Uh, I mean, I think it's obviously you do, but. Uh, so like who, who ran away from Iraq be, f- uh, because of Saddam discrimination against Shia extremists because there was a revolution against him and many of them became U.S. citizens and British citizens as well and when the uh, Saddam fell down they came back to Iraq and they organized the winning party of Iraq right now which is Hizb al-Dawah so Hizb al-Dawah was which is a Shia Islamist party which is like the Muslim Brotherhood version of, of the Shia party 
they most of these people used to live in the UK, the United States. They used to have lobby groups inside uh, DC and London and all of these influential capitals. And the moment Saddam fell down, they came back and they were able to gain power because they are the most. And, and the thing is, like, that is what most Americans were familiar with already, right? So they used to live in D.C. They saw, him, saw them at the White House. They saw them at the State Department. So the moment is like Saddam is gone. Okay, we know these guys, so we can trust them. And then Bush called al-Maliki a man of peace, who, who is like one of the reasons why we have the civil war in Iraq in the first place. And Obama came later, who made it maybe a thousand times worse than what Bush did. So, so- um, so what do you say to people that this shows that the United States should stay out of all this politics? It, what if somebody says like, okay, so this shows that there should be no meddling. These government they don't they don't seem to understand who to support. So maybe they should stay out of it. What, how would you say to them? Oh, can I add to Armin's question there? Um, actually, when when the Libya thing was happening, uh, there were a lot of people who uh, that you know a lot of liberals who oppose intervention in Iraq. Um, I know there was this one friend of mine who was a pacifist. And the same people who opposed intervention in Iraq were suddenly very, very adamant about the U.S. Why aren't they doing anything in Libya? So the problem was that, you know, they, if the U.S. goes in and does meddle somewhere, then it, it's a disaster. When they don't meddle, then that's a disaster too. Sorry, that's my baby crying. So um, it, it's like a damned if you do, damned if you don't type thing. Can um, I tell you the do you story? Think it would have been better? Can I tell if, you if the there story? Can I tell you the story of the first night America first intervened? It was on sure. March 19th. It's called the, the the Black Friday, okay? Gaddafi, it was a, m- a month after. I remember months, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you that story. That day, we heard Gaddafi, after the revolution, Gaddafi was, was uh, gathering his troops in, in a city called Beni Wali. And he was getting a convoy ready with all his weapons. He just got a shipment. Just he got he's got the fresh shipment from uh, Russia of weapons, and he was heading toward Benghazi, and the story was the convoy that uh, that was heading toward Benghazi was twenty kilometers, but then again we saw videos and it was forty kilometers, but then again we saw people uh, uh, some airplanes were in the sky and saw sixty kilometer uh, jets army jets. And it ended up to be actually 80 kilometers of convoy coming towards Benghazi with a clear order to stop the revolution at its track, to kill it. That's it. The Americans were intervening that day. They had 16 hours to intervene in Benghazi. If Americans didn't intervene that very same day, I would have I'd probably been dead because my picture was taken uh, in the in the court. And it was crucial that they intervened that very minute, that very hour, actually. I, 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 can't, I can't say, oh, the Americans messed up because they intervened. No, they say, maybe my life. And they, by the way, when Gaddafi was, he actually came into the city for 20 minutes. It, that's what, how long it took for uh, the NATO and the Allies uh, just to, to arrive. In those 20 minutes, he killed 91 people. That was the that was, when the was clear it, plan. When was this again, sir? When was March this? March nineteenth, March nineteenth, two thousand eleven, Black Friday. I'll show. I'll send you a video. It was ugly. It was mm. about to get like it was about. To, we were you were gonna see a massacre in Benghazi of the same massacre of you seeing on Homs and in Syria. And if Americans didn't intervene, yeah, there was a civil war in Libya. But I would say in that day, the the many lives they saved. If they had the army and they had they intervened, they saved so many lives, and they, they did good that day. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I I I think. Um, sorry, Yaz, do you have anything to say? Go ahead. I want to say that I think that Americans generally intervene because they're trying to do good. I know that there's this narrative that's going around saying, "Oh, yeah, America is going getting into wars because it makes them money, or because they want to steal oil, or because whatever." And I'm not saying that there's no truth to anything. Of course, war is good for the economy, but they're not looking to just looking to do good. And I am is back to what Armin was saying. My biggest problem is, yeah, that's great. We love that. That's fantastic. Thank you. You the little people in the world that are being oppressed. But my issue is 
when Americans go in to support Libya or in Iraq or in Syria, et cetera, et cetera, they do get confused with who they should be supporting. Yep, mm -hmm. exactly. And they end exactly. up, like you were saying, supporting the Islamists, who are the people who are actually doing the oppressing. So they're mm -hmm. they're supporting the oppressors. But our biggest question, and, and I think you, you kind of talked about this <laughs> earlier, Bilal, when I said there you hit the nail on the head, is how do we get that there are like-minded people in the East and those are the people that they should be working with. How do we get that message across? Because Obama didn't get that message. Hillary didn't get that message. And I don't think Trump is getting that message either because he's standing around in Saudi Arabia talking about how these guys are our buddies and Iran are the, the bad guys. So they're not, none of them are getting it. How are we gonna get through to these people? And that was my question. That was my question to Armin and to Ali when I met them that day. How can we confront that? Okay. And that, so that was I me throwing to, it back to you. Yes, yeah, so, sorry about that. I, I wanted to actually add on to what Yaz is saying and then and see what you have to say. So my experience, and I, I think, so I'm going to sort of broaden this a little bit. So my experience from living in, so I, I lived in um, uh, Tripoli as well. I actually met cool. Gaddafi as an inf infant. I'll tell you that story later. Remind me. Um, so what I saw in, in whether it was in Libya or Saudi Arabia is one of the things, and, and I wrote about this in my book, was that you can't criticize the government, right? You can't yeah. openly speak about uh, anything that's happened because then you're going to be whisked away in the middle of the night and nobody's going to hear from you again. Um, so you have, and like everybody, people there, when we were in Libya, you know, we had rations like eggs and milk and all that. This was in the late 70s, uh, early 80s. So it was a very sort of like socialist type system. Um, and people had grievances, right? They had political grievances, they had economic grievances, they had social grievances. Um, but they couldn't talk about them. They couldn't criticize anything. What they read in the papers was in Saudi Arabia, for example, it was America, it was Israel. They were causing it. But you could not criticize your own government. You also couldn't vote, so you didn't have the power to change anything. Um, but the only place where people, people could speak and could exercise their speech was at the khutbah or the sermon at the mosque on Friday. That's the only time you had any kind of exchange of ideas where the people talked about their daily lives. So all of their issues, all of their grievances got packaged up in this mosque sermon. And it was all packaged up in Allahu Akbar. And every political protest, you had people saying Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. So that, that, that kind of religion became a, a, an avenue for dissent. So what I think happened is that whenever you have these sort of dictatorships, right? Dictatorships are, uh, many of them, they, they use religion. Some of them are secular and they use religion. Some of them do go into Islamism, depending on what serves them. The only people, when you have decades and decades of these dictatorships, ships like Mubarak, like uh, Saddam, like Gaddafi, like Assad, then, and, and they're- Reza, they're Reza Shah and Ataturk. Right. And so I was going to get to the Shah really in a bit. But whenever you have this and decades of this, the only people who actually become organized enough uh, to gain and they provide social services to people and they actually get mass support uh, to organize an opposition are the Islamists. In Egypt, it was a Muslim Brotherhood. And, you know, we're seeing what's happening in Syria. In Libya, you're saying the same thing happened. And the precedent for this was when the Shah of Iran fell down. Uh, you know, there were a lot of there were secularists, there were feminist groups, communists. There were Islamist groups. Yeah, communists there, but the Islamists eventually won because they tend to be the most organized. So when the U.S. comes in and they're like, okay, who should we ally with? Who should we talk to? The the ones that have the most resources, the ones that are providing like healthcare and and uh, facilities and everything to the public, just happen to be during these dictatorships the Islamist groups and. Um, so the U.S. is like, okay, well, these guys are organized. Let's they already have the resources. Let's get together with them. And, and that's why I was asking why. Um, why would you? Because there's no other reason for the U.S. to do it. The reason they don't ally themselves with the people with but secular. I get values. that, Ali. I understand that. But my point, my my question <laughs> remains: How do we get the secular? wrist people in those areas to be strong and the way that we can do that is by supporting them here in the west yes 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 we can do that and the other thing is it's a matter it's also a matter of time like it, i think iran is sort of ahead of the game because they already had everything that's happening with the arab spring kind of happened in iran 1979 the islamists came in they replaced the saudi the the u.s supported uh, a secular dictator um and now there are cracks in the clerical establishment and when it comes down you can bet that there is going to be a very sort of pro-Western 
uh, kind of system that comes up. And that'll we're probably going to see that in the next 10 or 15 years, if not earlier, right? And uh, the reason that's going to happen is... For is, Iran? Is, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Iran, that, that, depend, is, that depends on who's re re is going to replace Khamenei. The, it, it does, but the, the thing is that uh, chances that at who's gonna, whoever's going to replace Khamenei is going to be somebody who's more hardline than him are very, very low. But the problem um, is that the people that elect the, uh, the, the, the Rahbar religious that they're already being selected right yeah so, 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 so uh, i mean khamenei is the one who chooses the ayatollah is the one who chooses the candidates for the elections right well the circle yeah it's circular but the circle is a little bit bigger than that but you're right that it's a circle yeah, it is. I don't want. I don't want to get into like a, too much detail on this. But what I'm saying is, right now there are a lot of cracks. The clerical establishment isn't. Is there are factions in there? There are rivalries. There's a lot of people who don't like each other. This is generally the approach that the U.S. is taking right now with Iran because they feel like the population is Ali, very pro secular. I, we but have the to do an, We have to do an episode on this because there's a disagreement on that. So with regard to Iran, just yeah, yeah, I, so I don't want to go into detail. Yeah, yeah. But I, my, my, uh, what I was saying was that uh, the if we can get like Yaz is saying, if we can get uh, people, the secular groups, and our liberal counterparts and our secular counterparts in those places to become organized and organized not only as in a united voice, but people who can, you know, like Hezbollah provides hospital services, they provide cash and social assistance to to families. Uh, that's the level of organization that we're talking about. If, if we can provide, if we can do something like that, I don't know how we go about it, but it, there's a long way to catch up with them. To Yas's point, before the the reason why they haven't gotten that far is because they don't even have a voice. How could they even organize when they can't even get their messages out there? So to Yas's point, for you to be able to empower them is use the, our free speech um, rights here to give them a voice yeah, over there. Yeah, yeah. I and agree. I was actually, I was actually going to. It's still going to be a very long game. I was actually going to say something like about that because I was, uh, you were, uh, yes, me was saying, how can we co combat like th those bad ideas with Islamists and the Western culture believing that Islamists are somehow better than se Eastern seculars or uh, non-Islamists in the, in the East. And I would say like one of the best ways is to actually one of Ali, Ali's book. I, I loved Ali's book, uh, The Atheist Muslim. I, I read it twice actually. And I would, I would so love to see, I would love to see a version of it, a version of it in Arabic. It's really crucial to, to see it in Arabic. Richard Dawkins' book. It's happening as we speak. That's great. That's yeah. That's great it's news. Actually, that's awesome. It's the publisher in Egypt that's uh, working on the translation. Wow. And wow. Persian too, actually in Persian too. I just that's got a Persian awesome version news. of it today. There's a yeah. There will be a lot happening this year. But go go ahead, Blow. Uh, that's that's great news actually in Arabic and like we have to you know it's gonna be in PDF PDF form it's gonna be in, in spread like like wildfire because these kind of books help a lot of people way more than you think and in the West you can show these these books and you can show what what we think just like the way Al Qaeda or ISIS yell their ideology we can write it we can articulate it in a much better way. We can, because we're right and they're wrong, but Islamists are not. I don't want to be. I don't want to be the asshole over here, but um, I mean, I, I, I have you are done. I, 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 uh, thank you. Uh, I have done extensive research on this, and there is an article that I've done from my research, which I, I, it's called "Why Why It's Easier to Start a Terrorist Group in the Middle East Than a Liberal One," and the the reason why. We fail. I mean, I mean, there is. I, I, I mean, many of it is actually have to do with Western foreign policy. I mean, the the fact that so, for example, if you start a terrorist group right now in Syria or Iraq, if you are a Sunni militia, you will get funding from Qatar, Saudi Arabia in a minute. And I know people like I know people who went to Doha and then they come with a million dollar and they come back to Syria and they fight against the Assad regime and all. And, and the same happens with with Shia militias who went to Iran. So there is, uh, and then what you have is that you have these three main countries, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Iran. Many of these countries have uh, financial alliances with the United States 
to the way that, and also with many countries in Western Europe, to give you an example, in Netherlands, uh, when there was this Van Gogh thing, when the guy was killed and there was a movement of some parliamentarians within the Netherlands. Yeah. Theo, Theo us, Van Gogh. Theo Van Gogh, yeah. when he was killed and stuff. And there were many parliamentarians who were trying to shut down that discussion about uh, the atheism and secularism within the Muslim world because Shell have a relationship with countries in Saudi Arabia and, and Qatar. And because the United, because in that, in that regard, the Netherlands have businesses with Saudi Arabia and Qatar, they were like, oh, well, uh, there are more important things to do. It's like, I mean, obviously, the, 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 the battle of ideas is extremely important. But, I mean, I, I've seen it in Iraq and I've seen it in many other places. If the jihadists have $10 trillion of funding and the secularists have uh, $500,000, I'm sorry, you cannot compete. You need weapons. You need education systems. You need like with with the Muslimists, with the with the Muslim Brotherhood and other people like them. They have a mosque in every district. They have a school yeah, in every. But how they, do you get the able, funding? I'm sorry, but, but this is the reality. The, no, no, like no, no, but have, how do you get the funding without a voice? No, right? what I'm saying is that the, you can that's do. That's what I was just saying, Fessel. No, like, that's yeah, exactly. You, what you, you can about. do all you want, but unless these teach like like. We, I have seen how the Shia Islamists were organized. They have a mosque in every district. It's much easier to have a, a conference every day and every Friday yes. where a secular is having to raise $10,000 in a Babylon hotel in East Baghdad uh, in which the entrance to that conference is $50. There is a huge difference of mobilization. So the Islamists have an advantage because they have alliances with Qatar and Saudi Arabia and Iran and they can speak, and they can speak freely. But we can't just give up, right? Like, no, no, I'm not saying we should give up. What I'm saying yeah. is that it's important. Like, it's always important to, like, uh, more Arabs read Richard Dawkins' book, more Arabs read uh, uh, al Rizbi's book. But if we're not able to change the policies within Western nations that... Uh, but how do you change the policies? By, by giving some attention like to the... his books, I was, I, was, I was getting to that. Like, with saying our... With, with podcasts like this, like... With, yeah. To, ch to change politics, you have to ch you have to get politicians the votes that they want, and to get those politicians the vote that they want, you have to change opinions on the ground, right? To get funding, you need to give people some. You need to give the spotlight to the people that do the fundraising. How could people get fundraising if they're not even getting their message out there? No, what I think is like ideas like rile up people. But Bilal, Bilal sorry, sorry, Faisal, I'm just gonna. I just want Bilal to uh, say what he was saying. I was saying. Uh, one of the best ways to talk to Westerns is to actually show to, to these shows, these podcasts. Uh, I love the Sam Harris moment. It, it was one of the best moments that ever happened. By talking about Islam like this openly with books, with podcasts, with shows, with seminars, with the way you do it, with you guys doing it. This is the best way to actually convince the West to change the policy. This is the best way. I, I, I don't see why... Faisal is so depressed on like getting money and somehow getting a party and electing a new president who agrees with us. I think we're I'm doing not, a great I'm job. Not by doing yeah, that. but Faisal I mean, does have a good point because at the end of the day, they are going to be looking to support where the money is. Right. So the Islamists and Qatar are the ones that have the money. Secularists so in, in these countries don't have any money. They're not going to be able to make any good deals with them. When Donald Trump was standing there and talking about how Saudi Arabians are his best buddy, the reason exactly. why, guess, let's, let's take a guess why he was doing that. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, this is more, I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to, I'm not saying that we should look for the money. I mean, you are a lawyer, you should know more about facts, but what I'm saying is that that the facts on the ground are that there are so many competing powers and for you to be a, 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 an important power in the region is that you get the funding you have. I mean, to organize a conference, you need thousands of dollars to organize, uh, mo to mobilize volunteers. Look at like, look at the U.S. elections. It was like billion dollar industry of like hiring people to volunteer and go door to door, hire people to speak at venues. It's David and Goliath the right now. We are definitely the little guy. And we're yeah, hey, yes, but, did, but, but, Dave, but David defeated Goliath. Yeah, it's it's getting better. Yeah, I'm, it is. I'm saying it is, it is getting, getting better. better. It is you getting are hearing better. voices like like the and and the fact that you're you've got Jake Tapper calling out Linda Sarsour. You've got Bill Maher going around and, and the biggest ex-Muslim gathering in London. That's great news. That's progress. 
And I'm not. I'm not talking. I'm not talking to be pessimistic. What I'm saying is that there is a bigger you picture are out there. If you look at, if you go, if you go look at the French Revolution, and if you look at how much the king and how much they had, well, how much the people had, and how much the people in power had, you would have never guessed that the people that people would have won. If you go you look never, at the, yeah. if you go look at Russia and look at the revolution there, you would have never guessed that the people would have ever won. If you, you look, look at, at the, the United start States, Christianity. Start yes. start or sort of a zoom. If you look at yeah. Muhammad, okay, let's learn from Muhammad. C compare Muhammad <laughs> to, to the Meccans. Right? Yeah. Would you? Three hundred people versus three thousand. The battle of and Badr. they had all the money and ass. all the gold and everything. How oh my god! Muhammad, you took the bullshit. All... <laughs> oh, my god. oh my god! We're feeding this bullshit. We're feeding the bullshit. Follow the example of the prophet. We have, we have to, to learn follow the from example. Muhammad. Don't get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's yeah, like yeah. The, I call him the original <laughs> Khaleesi because he liberated slaves and used them in battle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the Khaleesi. I'm named we, after that's the main one. I'm named after the main one. <laughs> hey, okay, by so, the way, by the way, Bilal, in 2011, when you said that United States came and uh, you know saved your life and everything, wasn't wasn't Clinton the Secretary of State when that happened? Yeah, wasn't she responsible for that as well? Yeah. So you can't. You have to give her credit for that if that's if that's you know. Okay. No, but I, I think my answer to you, my answer to you about that day on the event was that, uh, that it wasn't. When you, Did she loved that. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I understand. Like Hillary's definitely got the neocon thing. She loves Kissinger, all of that. But that's what I was try. What I was trying to get at uh, that day in my answer is that that both of these people have done it. This is not a partisan thing. The Republicans have yeah, done it. Course, and yeah. You've got the whole Soviet Afghan war um, as evidence of that. You got they just they have all done it. They've all done the same thing. They cannot figure out that region. They don't know how to do it. It's just very recently that they have started to figure can out. I give you, can I give you a small story about that? Can I give you a small story about that just before we go? Sure. The yeah, American yeah. ambassador that followed the American ambassador that died was almost exclusively meeting with Islamists to the point Islamists who are now involved in the civil war in actual crimes. We actually, we, I can show you pictures of the same Islamists she was meeting who are now terrorists in the war. Who are like people getting uh, the United States wants to capture and all of that, and she was meeting them. No, I wouldn't say regularly. I wouldn't well, say uh, maliciously. Let's hope Alishma. Let's hope Alishma is not listening to the podcast. Hold on, that was the policy. Sorry. That was that was the policy. That was the policy of her culture of the of what what Clinton and. Uh, Obama administration administration brought, and here's the thing: when you say when you say a closer relationship to Islamists, you can play down the line. But in Libya, they cross the line and it's a crime now. What happened to the ambassador who died is criminal matter. The thirty thousand email, there is something there. I, I can promise you, there is something Benghazi related there. I know that the drum has been beaten by the. The, by the Republicans all day, but I'm from Benghazi. I'm from the city. I can tell you that there is something that happened that night. They're not telling you, and if it comes out, I know Trump also said it. I know I'm coming as a Trump supporter. Lock her up, seriously. What what's gonna you what's know, gonna the, the few the few Trump supporters that we have left should love we'll love me. <laughs> we'll love me. Yeah, they're, <laughs> yeah, they're gonna love me. Yeah. <laughs> But the, problem, the problem with the whole Trump thing is that, you know, you have this, you're saying that there's something in the 30,000 emails and I would listen to it and I'd be like, oh, okay, maybe there is. Let's investigate that. Then Trump comes out and he says, hey, Russia, if you're listening, can you hack into the 30,000 emails? Oh my God. And suddenly, suddenly nobody's going to look at the 30,000 emails because all the credibility is gone. And my right? city, and that's the my city, my own does. people who died that night and who's, who continue dying in Benghazi, they're not going to get the truth because the douchebag is Ruining it for everybody. Well, look at our criticism of Islam. Like, you know, when we're criticizing Islam, everybody, we, we had a dialogue going, and now Trump comes in, he's like, ban all Muslim, and suddenly, like, we're all bigots. Okay, right great. We, lo we just lost the two remaining Trump supporters that were listening to you. Oh, no, yeah. I'm sorry. And, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. And I was like, and I was a real sissy. I was like, I hate him because of his position on the environment. That's all I hate about him. <laughs> Uh, to, to, oh, wrap up, to wrap it up, on a, to wrap it up on a positive note, uh, because we have an episode, episode coming as well. Uh, so, Bilal, how can people follow you? They don't. I don't want my identity to be followed. Okay, okay. then go, go back to I Olivia. need Faisal and Bilal to kiss and make up. 
Oh, they're Actually, they're fine. They're gonna be okay. I, I'll tell you quickly why I hate Shia so much. And he's picking got he's picking on on the least Shia person of all the Shias on the podcast. I know, <laughs> but here's yeah. the thing: when yeah. I was in in college, I was failing law school, and I my my uh, what do you call it? The muaddal. Uh, you know what they call it? Average, the, the GPA. The average. The GPA. It was dropping because I was failing every Sharia subject. And I even studied Sharia like during high school. But I was failing it because it was really difficult. So what I did is go to the best teacher of Sharia, which is the, is a Salafi. He's a really religious Salafi. And I would sit with him for four or five hours as a 19, 20 year old. And he would, uh, five, five hours? Five, five and a half of them would be dissing Shia and teaching me how to diss Shia. So I have this natural re- reflex. I was like, Shia, I hate them. I hate Shia. I hate them. Yeah. Like, another well, reason to hate Shia. Love, like, another yeah. Shia re- reason that I'll give, I'm going to give you right now to hate Shia is I'm going to tell my meeting Gaddafi story. So I was about one and a half years old. Um, I don't, I, obviously, I don't have direct memories of this, uh, but both of my parents were teachers at the University of Tripoli. So they were kind of like the power couple of professors um, over there. My dad was in urban planning. My mother was a professor of education. And um, uh, Gaddafi used to visit the University of Tripoli quite a bit. That was his, you know, it was the pride educational organization there. And uh, once when he came, you know, they had a whole celebration and I was the baby. My parents took me there. Uh, as a baby and when they were holding it and you know so he did his tv op where he picks up the baby and he's like oh look at this baby and uh apparently what i'm hearing is that he kissed me on the cheek oh my so, god yeah so i i was uh kissed by sadafi Qaddafi. um i let's end on that there you go ali can i ali can i tell you something really ugly really ugly okay they ha- they found out uh, that he, after that, that he had chambers. Memory, you want to talk about something ugly? yeah he yeah. had chambers <laughs> in the university that he had arrested uh, girls and raped them in the chambers in the university. They actually found them, and I can send you the link to the story. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's how oh, we okay, end the yeah. show. All right, that's how we'll end the show. There you so go. Speaking, I'm of, now. speaking of which, Gaddafi was evil, and uh, that ends up the episode for today. And Bilal, uh, you should write a book. Yeah, Thank I mean, you. I, mean, I, th- I think Thank your you. perspective. Uh, with, all my, with all my with all my disagreements, I am working something. I, I am working. I, I'm gonna try to work on something actually. Yeah. yeah. With, with all my Wonderful. disagreements with you from the start until the end, I'm I'm hope that uh, I, uh, I hate you, you have a, I hate you have an interesting perspective that I think many people might be interested in listening to. Um, thank you very much all for listening, and we will see you again in our next episode discussing a subject that many of our listeners were talking about. And uh, thank you, Bilal, and thank you, everyone. Have a great night. The Secular Jihadists have been made possible thanks to the gracious support of the Illuminati and the great state of Israel. That's what we have been told, but we haven't received our checks yet. In the meantime, we greatly appreciate the support of our current donors. Please consider supporting by sharing the podcast with your fellow heathens or by donating at patreon.com slash sjme. 